Hi, this is Phil, and I'm here to tell you all about the Capes and Lunatics Patreon. Don't miss out on our comic book creator interviews, including our monthly Chichester chats with comic book legend D.G. Chichester, superhero movie brackets, and our search for the worst comic book movie of all time, and many, many more specials, all completely uncensored. Access starts for $3 a month, full video when you pledge $5 a month. Check out the link in our show notes or go to patreon.com slash capesandlunatics. Hope to see you there. me hearties and welcome once again to full stream ahead <laughs> i be your captain charlie the professor Esser, and with me as always is me first mate and skinny rich friend yeah it's maz welcome maz oh hey tonight we are talking Ooh. 2021's Dune, uh, <clears throat> feature adaptation, adaptation, <laughs> feature adaptation of Frank Herbert's science fiction novel about the son of a noble family entrusted with the protection of the most valuable asset and most vital element in the galaxy. Our director, Denis Villeneuve, writers, John Sapitz gets our screenplay. Uh, Dennis Villeneuve also gets a screenplay by credit, along with Eric Roth. Uh, just expanding it out here. So we get all of our credits here. Uh, based on a novel by, of course, Frank Herbert. And then we get all the people uh, in order of appearance. Timothy Chalamet as Paul Atreides. Rebecca Ferguson as Lady Jessica Atreides. Oscar Isaac as Duke Leo Atreides. Leto. Uh, what? I'm sorry? Leto. Oh, Leto Atreides. Pardon me. Jason Momoa as Duncan, uh, Idaho. Duncan Idaho. Idaho. Stellan Skarsgård as Baron Vladimir Harkonnen. Oh, he is so good. Uh, Stephen McKinley Henderson as Thufit Hawat. Josh Thufir. Brolin as... Hawat. Thank you. Sophia Howat. <laughs> Josh Brolin as Gurney Halleck. That's the original uh, Patrick Stewart role. Um, Javier Barden as Stilgar. Uh, Sharon Duncan Brewster as Dr. Leet Kynes. Chen, Chen Chang as Dr. Wellington Yu. Dave Batista as Beast Rabin Harkonnen. Oh. Uh, yeah, that was, and that was the that was originally the Sting role, if I'm not mistaken, from the yes. original. Yes. No, no, Sting was uh, the younger brother. Um, oh, okay. He played the 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 older brother, the the more the the fatter, older, crueler uh, brother. Okay, I don't know if we've seen the Sting role yet. Then. No, uh, we have not. We didn't get very much of the House Harkonnen at all. I wish I would have gotten yeah. more of, of Raban. And I feel like they condensed all the oppression of the Harkonnen over the Fremen people into like a montage. I could have done with more of seeing why we should be so fearful of Raban or, or Rabin or however you want to mm -hmm. pronounce it. Well, you see, but right there, I think that is the mm. crux of it. So, and here's my grand unified theory of non-fandom of what exactly it is the emperor was trying to do. Because from a pure political standpoint, pitting the Harkonnens against the uh, Aristides... Atreides. Uh, 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 sorry, how do you pronounce it? Atreides. Atreides. P p pitting the Harkonnens against the Atreides makes perfect pol political sense. Because you have your two big house rivals. Let's put them in a antagonistic relationship. Let's let them fight it out, undermine each other, so that neither one rises to power against me. Right. 
what the emperor is trying to do based on my initial watching of this is i'm very interested in this piece of this by the way okay so here's the idea he realized the harkonnens are monsters Hmm. the house atreides are beloved what i will do is i will give house harkonnen the power and he will do this sort of secret secret secretly i will give house harkonnen the power to destroy house Ar- artreides raising house harkonnen but then also creating this fear in the galaxy that could house harkonnen unseat the emperor no 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 you must all rally to the emperor because the emperor is just and house harkonnen is evil He's actually effectively creating a dichotomy of politics within this galaxy so that he can stand against House Harkonnen. I always called them Harkorkians because from the David Lynch, they had the little things in their hearts. You pull them out. Oh, Oh, interesting. That's funny. That was my little my little egg corn uh, <laughs> understanding of this. That's always my problem in in, in this. Like I always called the uh, Benny uh, Jesuit, the the belly Jesuit, because <laughs> I just assumed because this was the one yeah. woman in the first one who she's pregnant, she has the baby, she's on the spice. Yeah, and, and which to my mind made sense. It's like, oh, you know, but and who knows, maybe he originally wrote that and he says, no, that's too obvious. Okay, we're going to Benny Jesuit. <laughs> um, <laughs> but so that's my view on what the Emperor is doing. No, I, I'm glad that, that that translated as as well as it did, because that's exactly it. You know, Leto oh, is getting okay, really great, powerful great. and the other houses go to him for leadership and they see him as a natural leader and he feels very threatened by it. So he creates a situation where the Harkonnens will take out the, the Atreides. And then obviously, um, yeah, I mean, that makes perfect sense that he would look good against, um, making the Harkonnens, you know, beat down the people, beat down the people. And then he gets to come in yeah. and be the savior and say, see, this is why I'm in charge. Everybody heal. Exactly. Exactly. So I'm, I'm glad know, that, that, that is, well. Um, what, yeah, what no, did that you think? Translated perfectly to me. What, what did you think of, like, here, I'll tell you a couple of things that I wonder if they translated well. Uh, having my perspective and then uh, of someone not having that perspective, did the movie do a good enough job of, of uh, what did you think of Le- Leto and Jessica's relationship? How did you understand that? I'm what sorry. did you understand about it? And how did you I'm sorry, bring it up a little bit. Oh, uh, what, what did you feel about Leto and Jessica's relationship? How did you understand that? How did you? Right oh. <clears throat> okay. Tristan, get off your phone. So, so what did you think about it? Cause I, I'm interested to hear sort of, um, how this translated, what you felt Jessica and Leto's relationship was. Um, yeah, how did you feel about it? And what did you understand about their relationship? Like, how did that translate? Oh, well, I mean, it kind of translated like most royal couples. Okay. You know, that there probably was some compassion there as well as. The fact that, you know, I mean, obviously, as is explicitly stated, she's a plant for the uh, Bene Gesserit, you know, that this is how they've been controlling the families for years. Um, just, you know, send, it, send a nice little honey pot to each of the houses. Mm. Make sure they get in good, you know, however they're going to get in good, either as trusted advisors or as honey pots. And, uh, you know, in that way, the Bene Gesserit actually can sort of pull the strings subtly behind the... Uh, the uh scenes because of course they have the ability to see the future and use mm. the word of power and all that kind of stuff so that's my take on it but i do feel that there was some kind of there, w- there was certainly love between uh lady jessica and paul mm. um but i assume that there was something similar with leto I, I don't think that he was in any way you know he certainly he he certainly i think he certainly cared for her yeah yeah. You know, and I would imagine that she cared for him as well on some level. You know? Yeah, I, I feel like I feel like that's I, I wish we got a little bit more of that because their story is is like they really, really deeply love each other. And yeah. um, like there's, there's so much more interesting political intrigue happening where um, there's other things that happen that he feels 
um, other people are showing him that Jessica's responsible for. Like the fact that she was a Benny Jesuit uh, was always known. That was just the circles they traveled in and they fell in love. But she was she was actually a concubine. He couldn't marry her uh, because she was just a concubine. But that is the woman he loved. And but he wasn't able to marry her for political reasons and yada yada yada. Um, and all we got was a simple little line where he says, I wish I would have married you. And it's so much more interesting than that. Right. And so like those, those situations yeah. where like he's, he's, uh, suspicious of her is not because she was a Benny Jesuit, because there were other things happening and that he was playing deeper political games where he had to act like he did think yeah. she was guilty and, but she didn't know. So she really is worried that he does and is so much more. And I guess you can't really go into it. And what we got was, was I guess good enough. Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, that, that, that's the problem is like, you know that, and that—that that I think is 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 the filmmaker's dilemma. Yeah, because you're trying to tell this story now. What I will tell you is, I didn't get that much detail because mm. it's like you know you're, you're like up to your eighth cross in that you know <laughs> where it's like oh yeah this that the other but and and when you get to what the core of what the arc of the story yeah. is, this is it's it. I mean, <laughs> not to. Not not to be rude to it, but it's like the prequels, you know. The I see. No, I I get it. I get it. And there's so you know, much. Like if you read stuff. Star Wars as a novel, if you read it as like this novelization over nine books with all this intrigue and in infighting and all these characters, you know, you might actually come away with it. You might even say Star Wars. That's an unfilmable. That's an unfilmable movie hmm. <laughs> because there's so much that goes on behind the scenes. That it's just hard to translate into one film. And that yeah. is what I think is the best part of this is that it's not one film. Right. That right. is like the saving grace of this. And what I want to say about it to get to the end of this film is it's not the end of this film, but it is the end of a chapter. And in fact, it's actually called chapter one. You know, it's Dune chapter one. Right. And how much we're going to get in chapter two and three is up for debate. Honestly, this could go to chapter nine. I'm not going to be mad about it if it's this quality. Although I think they don't need to do two hours worth of it. I mean, that's I, my I, point. That's the other part of it. It's like it's two and a half hours long and they took so much time on certain things. Uh, and, and whereas I, I feel like that time could have been spent more interestingly uh, building up the world, building up the political intrigue and, and the well, little goings on between people and what relies on this and what can't happen and consequences for this. That would have been way, way more interesting than focusing on, you know, like f 10 minute shots of them just sitting there or walking through the desert or giant explosions, which well, was nice. But, but, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. And here's what it is, is that 10 minutes of story made, and this is a picture's worth a thousand words, you know, 10 minutes of story can take much longer to tell than seeing some amazing visuals. And right. I do want to talk about the visuals here because I mean, I don't know if they had the dragon fly, the, 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 the hopters, I think they called them. Hopters. Yeah. The, the little dragon, which I, I am wondering about the physics about is that in any way possible? But you know what? It's a, it's a ludicrous concept because it was written in 1965 and it's about a society of people that have forsaken all artificial intelligence of, or any thinking machines, right? So they can't have... See, I didn't know that. Right, so uh, that that's the, the the whole idea. Like, back in the day, AI got too powerful and there was a ah. big, uh, uh, what they call the Butlerian Jihad, which was the people banding against the AI and the robots and they were defeated and there was a law across all the universe that no thinking machines or no machines meant to mimic a human brain could be made. It's illegal. There's pockets of like outside the galaxies, you know, where stuff is happening, but like for the, it's barred generally. Um, so they have like these machines that are kind of like quaint and almost steampunkish because they're forced down different roads of thinking because they don't know any better sometimes. So sometimes you get like these stopters. And in the old movie, it's like a really weird concept to try to make modern. But I thought they did a really, really good job of making them like super sonic speed. Um, yeah, no, that, that sounded worked believable. For me. That and was and like, it, it, it looked cool. Yeah, I thought it was beautifully done. You know, um, oh man, I mean, here's what I can tell you. We you know what is the best aspect of this film. This was like one of the best at the very start. You know, Paul says to Aquaman, you know, I have this vision of you dying. And I feel if I was there, maybe you wouldn't have died. But then you actually see that 
he dies and he is there. That has nothing to do with whether or not he was there or not. This is just what was going to happen. This was the destiny. This was the call to destiny. And that is what is the whole point of this first chapter. This is Paul's call to destiny. Paul is the, he is, he is, he is the space Jesus, you know, as troubling as that notion can be sometimes. Um, he is the, he is this being meant to come and, but somehow unite all the houses, hopefully, maybe. I don't know. I don't know what happens next. I've read all the books. If I had, maybe I'd like, ah, well, this is where this is all going to go. But I have it, and that's so enjoyable, too, because now I'm like, oh, what's going to happen next, you know? And I don't necessarily so, so, want it to just have yeah, a What little, did you think of Paul's yet. journey? What did you think of Paul's journey? Where he starts, where he ends up, and did you think it was earned? Yeah, I actually thought every part of it made sense to me. I mean, I, I love the fact that we haven't even met Zendaya yet. That we've mm. seen her several times, but we've never actually really been introduced to Zendaya's character right. in this story. We just see her as what I find kind of funny is kind of in the same role she plays in Spider-Man, just sort of this <laughs> this uh winking, knowing Fay, you know. She just Yeah, that's funny. She's like always six steps ahead of you anyway, and that's why you love her so much. Yeah, she's really good at that character. Supposedly, Denny Villeneuve said that she's going to be the main character of the second movie, which is very fascinating. I can imagine that. I can see that. And so here's I'm okay here's, for that. Here was my thing. I think the meat of the story, or one of my favorite narrative threads in the story, or the one of the most important ones, is Paul dealing with these visions that he's having. Is Paul dealing with? Uh, becoming something more i didn't feel like i got enough of that struggle i got like he struggled with it in the moment but i never got that those questions meant anything to him after those experiences were done um so like he has to to find like what those things means he has to be troubled by it and i i wanted it to be where he gets to the planet arrakis and he hears these legends of, of, uh, Lisan al Gaib and blah, blah, blah. And slowly these things coalesce and come together. Oh, am I supposed to be this or am I not? You know, I didn't get enough of that, that, that trajectory from one place to the other getting there. Um, and then towards the end, when he finally meets the Fremen in the desert, um, like the ease with which he wields that position like i am going to be the blah 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 and i'll marry his daughter and i'll do this and yada 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 it's a lot to like all of a sudden you're smart enough to do that like how did you get from here to here so quickly well i mean uh, to be fair and to be fair when he does because actually that's two and this is what i'll say from my obser observation those are two separate tracks the marrying of the emperor's daughters is him still being paul and him right, but, but, but to be speech. thinking on that political level, that grand level, and to have the confidence to step into that role and say, yes, I am good. Like, it seems like, I don't know, you'd have to do no, a no, lot no, of... No. Well, because that's what he was raised to. That was That's what he was born to. That was, in fact, his father tells him, they're talking about their grandfather fighting bulls for sport, which I have to imagine bulls are extinct in this universe, or like whatever it is. It's like this weird mythical being that, oh yeah, oh crazy grandpa, I'm in fighting bulls. Uh, um, you know, uh, one more, one more, um, oh, who wrote that? Atreides are apparently one of the houses that can trace their lineage back to original Earth. Yeah, but, um, you know, and it's to Spain, I imagine, or at least Mexico. Oh, Greece, um, Greece. Oh, Greece. That's where they're supposedly from. They fight bulls in Greece? I don't know. I don't know. Well, you know, yeah, it's been yeah, exactly. like five thousand years. It's <laughs> somewhere, and, sometimes someone felt, hey, we fought bulls at some point. I, I, and this was written in sixty-five, so you know. Yeah. So anyway, but um, no, but that was the thing. It's like I really felt that you had this father who had groomed his child to be a diplomat. That he is okay. Always, interesting. It, it, it's sort of it's sort of like with with the whole um, 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, but like the, thing. I feel like the confidence that he met that with, he didn't struggle enough to get it. There were moments where he had explosions of struggle, but there was no constant thought about it. There was no figuring things out. He would just endure the struggle, right? He would never beat the struggle. He always endured the struggle here. So there was nothing, there was no revelations oh. to him that would lead him to this point in a sense. I think that's the problem I'm but having. You see, it. you see, I think that is maybe my, see, see, and this I think is the advantage of having at least a physically appearing younger Paul versus mm. Kyle McLaughlin, mm. who was clearly a, a fully adult Paul. <laughs> you know, Kyle McLaughlin was fully adult. He right. was this this guy. This guy looks like Peter Parker. This guy looks right. like a young man thrust into greatness right. against his will. And and in that way, that makes those shifts seem logical so when he is mad at his mom for making him a freak which right. i loved because it is a typical young man's lament about the position he's been put in and then and, his he, that's maybe the I'll thing, just the emperor's daughter it's not it's not supposed to be well i mean like it's supposed no. to be whatever like the movie is presenting it one way like that's a moment where like he has a vision and he finally comes to recognize his purpose. He finally sees his entire future and like what he has to do to like prevent certain things from happening. And like, that's what he's upset about. Not that you made me a freak, but it's like, you know, like, Oh my God, the responsibility you just put on me. Do you have any idea what you have just done to me? Like, and that's a heavy moment. And they just turned it in. I mean, like, uh, you know, I guess it's no, minor, and, gripe, and minor, and tiny gripe, but like, you know, yeah. uh, it's supposed to, uh, I thought it would mean so much more. And that's the sort of gravity I was looking for a lot more of his performances that I didn't get. And then like at the yeah. end, he's able to beat Jarmus, right? And like from the beginning, we see him as, you know, like, oh, he can, you know, play fight with a Gurney Halleck or whatever. But there is something to him. Uh, there's something to the, the, what the Bene Gesserit have taught him called the weirding way. And it's like this, this ethereal concept that's really hard to describe, kind of like the force, I guess, or whatever. But they have a way of like making you do things or like uh, some sort of magic. They don't really describe, but there is something to them that makes them pretty potent at fighting. Um, and like we see him as, you know, just like a, a noble kid, you know, a teenage from a noble family probably really can't fight. He practices with Gurney and all of a sudden he's beating this Fremen guy. I wish we could have seen some more early um, indications of his... Okay. Uh, command of of fighting so um, and then on is... top of that also when they meet the fremen mm -hmm. and that scene with uh jessica fighting stilgar i felt i wanted more out of it because she's like a capable benny jesuit capable in the weirding way uh which makes her a really formidable fighter and like that fight should have been like more interesting given her more room to like flex what a benny jesuit can do and then stilgar says oh that's why she's valuable to the tribe because she can teach us the weirding ways and that's how they accept her as uh, you know, one of their rev reverent mm -hmm. mothers and whatnot. So I, I, I wanted more from that scene, from Jessica so, and from uh, from Paul. Okay, and I I hear that and I can understand that. Um, here is my take on it, hmm. which is so. Here's one of the things that really bugged me about this film is to me all of the fighting sequences looked way too choreographed. Oh. It looked like fight scenes out of West Side Story. You know, where it's like a lot of the movements, but then it strikes me. That w this would you say it was also similar to Kill Bill or was it different from Kill Bill in a way? I've never actually seen Kill Bill. Okay, never mind. Okay, never mind. So, no, no, but this is like to me, it's more like the way they fight, it's much more like, okay, you make a move, now I'll make a move. And, but here's the thing, and this is what makes it make sense is when earlier on in the film, um, Paul is watching the video of how, like, the way that uh, Fremen walk. Because you have to walk in a way that mimics the desert. And it is just like, you take a step, then you move to the side, then you do a sweep. Because you're trying to not have that rhythm of pound, 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 pound. Which, for what it's worth, people are running all throughout this. And, you know, it only, no, it only I, I think the idea is, you know, you're, you're just bettering your chances. You know, chances are you might not yeah. see a worm. You could run across it. But, like, if you think but there's it, a worm around, you know, do that. But it makes sense that anyone going to this world would know that. That as right. you go into this world, you're going to know that that's how you have to fight. That's how you have to move. It has to be this musical arrhythmic dance 
right. all times. And that is sort of one of these little things where it's like, oh, that's why they're moving like that. That's why. I think it's also because like the shields that they use, the personal shields, mm -hmm. have made it so that you can not really use projectile weapons. Um, because like some sort of thing, if you're using like a, a projectile laser weapon or something, it can cause like a nuclear explosion that wipe like a, a, a whole continent out. So nobody uses certain kind of weapons. So we've been forced to use, uh, swords and whatnot. And with the shields, the shields are such that if you strike fast, it's, it's going to block it. But if you go real slow, it's not going to block you. So there's a certain yeah. pattern of fighting that has developed maybe because of that, that forces them to look stylized. But I'm, I'm probably thinking because, my, my honest thought is like, I think they spent a lot of time trying to make it look pretty and trying to give you an experience or like bring you into that mm -hmm. world rather than to make it just a story about political intrigue or whatnot. So I think in that oh, respect, yeah. I, it probably was that the choreographer was a little, you know, enjoying himself too much and yeah, but you wanted know, to make but it look pretty rather you than. The, you got the political intrigue too. I mean, it wasn't, may mm -hmm. not be at the level, it, it's sort of like right. Game of Thrones, you know? Game yeah. of Thrones is all political intrigue, but you also want to have a dragon or two in there. And, yeah. you know, as long as you have a book to work from, you're okay. <laughs> um, yeah. And they still got lots of books. They were smart. They didn't just do the whole book series in one movie. Right. And they tried to build a universe. They said, you know what? We got a whole universe we can tell. We got a lot of stories to tell. I just feel like this, maybe, there's like so the much. Third movie, we're going to start to flex our muscles, you know? I hope so. I hope the cinematography takes a backseat uh, a bit more to the storytelling. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't know how Villanova is as a cinematog as, as a storyteller. He may mm. rely heavily on cinematography, which many, many people do. Uh, I, you know, it's one of these things where, and it's sort of like how you watch a film, which I think is one of these things that's always, and he's maybe even something I'll even say. Now, this is full stream ahead where we do streaming content, although you saw it in the theater. I watched it over three days on various devices, including my phone this, at, this uh. afternoon. And what I'm going to tell you is, is that the story translated actually really well. So you could watch it in the streaming format. You could get these little details because they made yeah. sure to shine a light on the details you needed to know mm. at the times you needed to know them. That if you were paying attention, you, you carry that all forward. And I mean, so... I I'm really glad I did get to see it in the movie theater because, like, the grandeur, the scope of it was so magnificent and so impressive. Like, that moment where the Atreides land, or, or uh, yeah, where the Atreides uh, land on Arrakis and that Atreides march is playing in the background and, and it's, like, these weird discordant sounds and it's, like, all of a sudden it's, like, ah, this is so uncomfortable. What chord is that? Why would you play that chord? And all of a sudden it's the next chord types. kicks in. And then it's like, okay, but there's back to, but there was like these just we really strange choices and like, and it's designed to make you feel uncomfortable. Uh, and then it, it like marches on into like this celebratory theme and they're like, yeah, I'm really uncomfortable, but I get it. It really puts you in that feeling of like being in a fight and, and like kind of enjoying it. It's a really strange thing, but like the sound design for this was really, really crazy cool. Um, all like yeah. the, the, the percussive sounds is like, I don't know if it was music or whatnot, but like, if there are other worlds, like, I mean, I can imagine a, a wider variety of experiences would come up with a wider expression of music. Um, and maybe yeah. some of this is just that. So from that perspective, it was amazing. I will say this film felt very real to me hmm. on its basic level. And I loved, like, for example, the, um, the Baron, Baron Harcourt. And he is so doing Marlon Brando. <laughs> that is just Brando in um, Heart of Darkness. That is just, you know, he is just, you know, even doing the pouring the water on his head kind of thing, you know. Every minute of that, I was like, oh, Marlon Brando. I get it. Which yeah. makes me think, man, if only they could have gotten Brando for that role, you know, back in the wow, day, that yeah. would have been amazing, you know. Yeah. This was a this was a role he could have totally embraced and probably would have enjoyed. He liked to play a bad guy, um, yeah. and he wouldn't have had to lose weight for it, which is great because he right. liked that, you know. Uh, they he could they, lose they weight when he had to, but he didn't like to. Right, and then for this, he could have said, "Oh no, 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 go nuts, go nuts." You know? Yeah. Um, well, you know, and that was the other thing. I liked the Baron Harkonnen a lot better in this than I did in the David Lynch version. It was like a lot David less Lynch body version horror. Really felt like uh, Adam West Batman versus this yeah. would be like the Dark Knight. 
you know? Yes, yes. I can absolutely see that, you know? It, it, it was a much bolder, but, you know, and you can say it's for the times, you know? Yeah. That, that was the style, that, that was the style at the time, you know? <laughs> yeah. And it, it worked for what it was. And I, I will always say it was, it was an enjoyable film. I have the board game. Mm. And so you two can come to my house and we can play the board game and fight for the spice control of, of Acker, of, of Arrakis. 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 And, um, you know, but there's all these things that I didn't even like the idea that there is this huge amount of water in the sands that they, mm. That if they could release, they could actually turn Arrakis into this paradise. Not um, not a huge amount, but like they had well, hopes of it of terraforming and you know. Well, what it is is it remind because this was a theory I had about the Dune Sea in Star Wars. This is the thing I have to compare it to Star Wars because this is a as Lilith Hellfire recently said, it's a really good Star Wars film. Like this is well, like this is what yeah yeah you know. But this idea that, you know, there, that if you have these, and here's the thing, if you have these giant worms, there's got to be a lot of water somewhere. No, the, the worms are afraid of water. Like the water hurts them. They need the planet to be a desert. Um, and I find it interesting that they chose to sort of put that because that comes so much later in so much further into the books yeah. where they try to terraform well, the planet. And then they yeah. realize that the worms don't are, are dying out. There's not enough worms. And so then the political intrigue comes in following centuries that like the worms are dying out. But then the people that are in power is like, yeah, but it serves me to have my little air, whatever. So what if there's yeah. less worms? There'll be less spice. The spice will be worth more and we'll have all of it. Um, kind of idea. Uh, so like, okay, okay. You know, so, so like the worms are the worms. So wor- obviously worms. the spice. Yeah. But you see, but that's the thing. It's like, you know, in and again, this is just me being putting science onto onto a science fan because again, like Star Wars, this is science fantasy, not science fiction. Right. You know, this is one where if you if you just eat the right mushroom, man, you can travel anywhere you want to. <laughs> um, and that is the premise of the of the, of the pre- presentation. But um, I suppose on some level, it is this idea that you know, however life evolved on Arrakis. There is water that is useful, but that water in its pure form may be deadly to things because no, they're not no. used to engaging with. So water that's and I, and I wish they went more into this because, like, when he came, when yeah. Stilgar comes in to meet Leto, and he spits on the desk, right? Like, that's a a really deeply reverential thing to do because that's why they wear these still suits. That's why they they. Yeah and poop in their still suits because that water gets converted their sweat gets converted tears everything gets converted so they can drink water water is life like that's like their religion the fremen that live in the desert so yeah, yeah, yeah. water yeah. is uh, of such importance uh, so so from that perspective like um uh that i wish they went into more uh, of how important water was to them or how religiously well, they I looked mean, at the idea of water like when somebody dies they'll like take his water because when they're in the desert they meet them for the first time hey, let's take her water Right, that's what the the way they talk. Everything is about they kill somebody, they don't let any blood drip. They will uh, harvest all the water to to store for their uh tribe in, in the case. Yeah, so and like, you actually see they take the body with them. Right. When he kills the guy cuz Yeah. I, I know, wish we could have uh, given more example. Like I think well, things like know, that deserve I, more time than Yeah, but the fact of the matter, I guess I guess it's the kind of thing where and that's the thing if you get like four paragraphs explaining it, it's really good. But I think that if you're watching it, you you get that you get because it's get, all right, fair point, enough. You know, because you get the whole point that this that spitting actually has a different meaning in this culture. Yeah, because you because you see Aquaman, Jason Momoa, pull him back and say, "No, that's not what this means. That's that is a great honor for you to spit upon our floor. You know what it's going to do on the floor. I don't know, but thank you for sharing your moisture." Um, yeah. It kind yeah. of makes you think that that's one of those things that actually can have a very negative connotation, but you're just supposed to take it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But, um, but as it, as it plays out, you know, I, I, I got the sacredness of the water. I, in fact, I even loved the line that Paul says when he gives his mom water at some point from the bag. It's like, yes, it's from our, from sweat and tears. Yeah. You know, which is just such a beautiful line yeah. to integrate into the story, which I thought was just brilliant. Yeah. Oh, you know, so really, I really mean, that. you know, I, that, 
that's the thing. So it, it's like, you know, it's so it's sort of like as a super fan of certain things, I get that. Like, mm. I'm very mad right now about things that are coming out about the new Ms. Marvel TV show that mm. really is making me mad. But maybe for people that aren't the super fan that I am, it's going to make sense to them. Mm. And that's a whole other bag of hammers. Now, what I can say is, as a person who's not a Dune super fan, this film really did make me interested in, in what the story is going to be. Even though I, you know, I saw the David Lynch thing, I know that at least at some point there's some like turn and Paul finds himself in a positive position. He gets out of the hole, but you know, as you say, these stories could go on for hundreds of years. So maybe I shouldn't be too bound to that. <laughs> what this whole thing is going to grow into, but it'll be fun to see it. I want to see where it goes next. And yeah. I think that's what you want when you're making a movie is can we get people to want to come back again and sit down again? And did well at the box office. It did really, it, it did really well. And I'm glad. Because I do want to see the second one. And and I thought it was a, a great movie. Um, just because I, I felt cheated or I wanted more. It is what it is. But I thought it was a phenomenal movie. Uh, I enjoyed yeah. the ride. I appreciated every moment. You know, when they started Jessica speaking in the Atreides battle language. It's like, oh, you know, there were all these moments that were really, really cool to see. Um but but then there were like a a lot of things, and again, this is one of the things I really want to talk about too. Um, Jessica's performance as she's walking Paul into the meeting with the Reverend Mother to face the Gomjabar, that like her reactions are like she's crying. She's like, "Oh no, have I done the wrong thing?" Like Paul could die, and when Paul walks in there all cavalier and blah blah blah, and he's like making jokes and like ah, and he goes through a little pain, but like. I don't know. It, it didn't seem balanced. Her reaction seemed so intense. And the way the scene went on the inside, yeah, visually it looked cool. It looked kind of like a Geigerish well, painting. Yeah, but, but like well, I didn't no, get man. the gravity from his sense that he was in any yeah. danger, really. Well, because he's not supposed to recognize the danger until he puts his hand in the box. Yeah. That's Even the then, it was he's just, it, yeah. In, well, no, when they, when they put the Q tip in his ear, um, <laughs> you know, well, there's some silly visuals when you think about it. It's like, what are they doing? They're putting a Q-tip in his ear? But, you know, <laughs> hand in the box, Q-tip in the ear. Now, what do you feel? And it's like, yeah. but you could, I got that he was really, he could feel the pain there. And that's where he felt the weight. I, I really felt that he felt the weight in that moment. He's cavalier at the start, expressly because, you know, he's he's the Bonnie Prince, you know? Yeah. And he's coming in as the Bonnie Prince. And he's expecting this to be just one more training session like he's gone through with his mom before. And it's a little more intense than that. But he survives it because and that, that's, that's, that's why it, it should have been more than a little more intense than you know, it's like Well, but the thing is, here's what I'll say about him. He is not a Mary Sue because he has to do it twice. <laughs> you know? It's like there's one where he fails and one where he succeeds. Mm. And um, that's how you know that, okay, it's not a guarantee it's always going to work, but he can do it a little bit. In fact, I actually liked that little bit when he first tries to control the one guard and she says, you know, your little pitchy dog. Yeah. <laughs> and he's yeah. like, Mom, I'm doing my best. You know, like but I the said, way they handled the voice was great. Great. Because oh, yeah. in the old movie, it was kind of hard. Like, and when I was reading the book at first, like, the way they talk about what the voice is, it always seemed to be more really about psychology, right? Do you know how to like properly communicate what you're saying? Obviously done with like some elements of magic or whatever, but it's just an understanding of human sight. And, and as like a, a salesperson, that's just really, really made me smile. Uh, but the way they handled it in the old movie was kind of weird. But the way they did it here, when he first says his, to his mother, give me the water, you almost feel like a shockwave where the sound doesn't happen and then it comes later. What a great and interesting way to present like that. It's it's doing something, but it's something physical. It's not magical, but they get stunned or something. But there's there's, yeah. there's something happening there. But it was a great way to f show the physics of something happening uh, that makes the voice work. I thought that was really, really cool. They're doing their best. They're doing their best, Mozzie. I okay. thought that was great. I thought that was great. Okay. Um, any final thoughts on tonight's show? Um, no, the, no I, and, and it's like, that's the trouble I'm having with expressing myself when it comes to this. I don't know how to do it in a way that properly reflects the reverence I have for it. 
without feeling like I'm silencing my own criticisms to do it. You yeah, know, it's yeah. a, it's a weird, but I, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was great. It gave me everything I wanted, but I wanted a little bit more. I guess I'll put it that way. Yeah. And, and that, you know, that's fair. We always want more. Um, and you know, it's the, it's the old saying about the, about the uh, tricky shrug and you must leave one knot undone. Cause if you tied that last knot, it would be perfect. And only God can be perfect. So every imperfection must be left. You must always leave an imp- imperfection so that you are not searching for imperfections. You yes. know where it is. It's a, it's a tiny little box right there. I yes. don't have to drive myself crazy looking for it. Yes, exactly. And so there, there you go. I mean, like for me as not a super fan, as a guy who's never read the books, but who appreciates the idea and symbology of of the of the of the uh fandom and the mythos um it really it really it really struck me as well you know a bit longer than i needed it to be but that's okay you know i can live with a long movie i live through all the marvel movies this is less fighting but but you know the one other thing that i really wish we got more of that such deserves such attention is is the idea that like you know and and isn't it obviously a little strange that this kid gets here and all of a sudden he's the mahdi he's the mahdi yeah, you know he's yeah. supposed to be the messiah well, how did that idea even get formed in their heads you know like he they, there's certain things that you know he does that some people find out about and the legend grows oh there's this kid that showed up he's from another world just like the legend and he did this and like oh people get to talking and then like when when he sees them they say it, and he's like what is this and he goes is that what i'm supposed to, is that why i'm having these visions you know um and then on top of that they give like a little line where he says oh they think you're the messiah he's like oh the benny jesuit have been at work here he goes planting legends and like the idea of this the Benny Gesserit their plans are seeing so far ahead that for centuries they've been sending little things to different planets with primitive species and primitive societies and planting legends and so one day if they ever need to escape somewhere they can go there and they can act like it's amazing the level of like I mean the 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 planning yeah. that goes into the Benny Gesserit are amazing and I'm glad they're getting an HBO show that'll do uh like a prequel to what their oh, order wow. is possible so there you go. There's everything you wanted, Maz. I know. You're going to get, I, your, I, get your extra content, okay? I know. That's our I, modern It just world. deserved like that. Deserved so much more attention. I know, but you got to get all the. You got to get. You got to get all the rubes like myself hooked on this. And now we're going to go watch Bene Gesserit the mm. series. Mm, I can't you know, wait it's for like that. the Mandalorian the series. Like, oh, yeah. what are they going to do with baby Bene Gesserit? I don't know. It's going to be exciting. <laughs> Talk about baby Betty Jesuit. Um, Jessica's pregnant here, right? Oh boy. Yeah. Oh, I know. Oh. I, I, saw the, I saw the David Lynch movie. I know where this goes. Oh, fair enough. Oh. Yeah. Oh, man. Get the blue baby. It'll be great. Um, <laughs> all oh, right. Oh, Mozzie. This has been a fun night. If yeah, anyone man. wants to talk to you about how much they enjoyed this or how much they hated it or how much they just loved it just enough to not hate it and it makes yeah. them so mad. Yeah. How can they find you? <laughs> they, can, they can do all of that if they email me at mazmanzor at gmail.com uh, or reach out to me on Facebook under Moz Manzor. That's M O Z M A N Z O O R. And of course, you can always uh, reach out to the Capes and Lunatics Network, of which we are a part happily at capesandlunatics at gmail.com. You can call us and leave a message if you want to have your thoughts heard here on full stream ahead by calling 614-382-2737 that's 614-38 capes and go to linktree slash capes and lunatics that's l-i-n-k-t-r dot e-e slash capes and lunatics we can find all of kinds of merch that we have which you can purchase if you do all those things and you still want to talk to me personally you can always write to me in that old-fashioned email way, the way our mothers and fathers once did, at superconnectivityblog at gmail.com. That's superconnectivityblog, all one word, at gmail.com. And, of course, follow me on Twitter as I live tweet things like Stargirl every so often, at Charlie Esser. That's C-H-A-R-L-I-E-S-S-E-R. Look for the two E's in the middle. For quality. Bing! Thank you, Maz. All right, me hearties, it's been another delightful trip here at sea as we face all kinds of woes but come back again next week as we once again sail full stream ahead Arrgh.